good morning, good afternoon, good day to everybody who is uh, joining us for this roundtable discussion today. Uh, the roundtable discussion, uh, panel nine of this week's annual electoral integrity uh, project conference is dedicated to the topic election observation in the West, challenges, lessons learned, and the way forward. And we are very happy to co-convene this between the Carter Center in the USA and the Election Watch EU network in the European Union. And that already sets the theme. Today, uh, for the first time, we would like to discuss the emerging uh, relevance, emerging theme, emerging challenges, obstacles, but also opportunities that come with election observation inside uh, the United States, inside the uh, European Union. All the challenges that that involves, but also new perspectives that it may uh, shed light on the exercise of uh, international and citizen election observation as such. And to that end, we are uh, grateful to be able to welcome uh, a great round of uh, panelists and contributors to our roundtable today. This is first David Carroll, director of the uh, Democracy uh, Center at the Carter Center in Atlanta, uh, followed by Armin Rabic, chairperson of Election Watch EU. We are also happy to welcome uh, Ambassador Ursula Gacek, who used to be the OSCE ODIR head of mission uh, in the US in 2020, but also in France in 2022 and is speaking to us from Uzbekistan today. We have with us Brenda Santa Maria, the head of the electoral observation section at the uh, Organization for American States. And Olufuntu Akinduro, Senior Program Officer for Elections at International Deer in Addis Ababa. Here with me chairing the panel is uh, Avery Davis Roberts, Associate Director with the Carter Center. And my name is Michael Lidor. I am a Senior Advisor and Co-Founder with Election Watch EU. Uh, we are very glad and grateful to the EIP team to host us today. And before I will ask the first question uh, to David here in the room, uh, I'd like to hand over to Avery for a few additional uh, welcoming words. Thank you, Michael, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have you with us this morning for this conversation about election observation in the West, as Michael just um, highlighted. I think that this is going to be a pretty wide ranging conversation. I think that it will really draw out some of the unique opportunities and challenges of observing in uh, the United States and North America, perhaps, uh, but also in Europe. And we'll also highlight some of the ways that it's quite similar to work that we do in other parts of the world, even if we haven't perhaps always thought about uh, election observation in the context of Europe and, and the United States with that sort of framing. So I think that there will be a lot of rich discussion and we're looking forward to also, you know, thinking more about how we can engage the research community in these conversations about election observation, helping us as uh, practitioners to think differently about the work that we do, but also maybe uh, asking for your help and assistance as we continue to try and improve election observation methods, techniques, approaches uh, in, in our geographic areas of focus for today's conversation, but also globally. Uh, so looking forward to the conversation. And with that, Michael, let me hand back over to you for the first question. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Avery. And so, uh, as you can see, we will uh, hold this as an interactive conversation. Uh, and uh, this is also the guidance provided to the participants in the roundtable. We will have short rounds of questions and answers. And we do a few rounds of those before we will open the room. And uh, we'll be happy to take questions from the audience as well. But let me now turn to David. And David, let me ask you, you know, you have been uh, so present and so influential in the world of 
uh, election observation globally for, for more than two decades. And you have led uh, the Carter Center in this exercise around the world. And more recently, we can see the Carter Center is uh, starting more and more to get uh, uh, engaged around uh, elections and around election observation uh, at home in the United States. So how did this come about and, 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 and why after, after the years you decided to take this step? Well, thank you, Michael and Avery. And good morning, everyone. Um, yes, so it's true since uh, 2000, so over three years now, the Carter Center has been working on elections in the United States, um, both nonpartisan citizen observation as well as other activities. And uh, Avery can actually, I hope, contribute quite a bit to this discussion, not just as a moderator, but as, as a you know, full participant discussant, as she's really leading most of our work uh, in the United States in this area. And in terms of how this came about, it really was just a, a culmination of a long-term reflection by us at the Carter Center, key colleagues and others, realizing that the, the nature of political problems in the United States were very similar to what we had seen in many of the countries where we've been engaged internationally, centered on questions of, you know, uh, de decreasing public trust and confidence in elections and knowing that citizen observation can be part of a solution to that question. So it's really, a, a, you know, in terms of, you know, is this relevant to the United States and to the West? I think uh, it's hugely relevant in the, in the sense that, uh, you know, observation can, can play a big role here, but there's, a, I think there's challenges and the potential is something we're gonna need to see if we can really make that difference over time. All right, Avery, as, you have been instrumental in bringing this about from the beginning. Maybe you want to, to say a quick word on it already before you, you, you continue with your questions to Armin as well. Yes, thank you, Michael. I mean, I think that you know, one of the things that we, and this will probably come up again as a thread throughout the conversation, one of the challenges that we've really um, faced as we've been trying to embark on our citizen observation work in the United States is that there just isn't a kind of culture of observation of, as we see in other parts of the world. It's something that, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're having to sort of educate uh, voters, educate election officials, educate the sort of the broader electoral community on the sort of the benefits of, of nonpartisan citizen observation uh, and sort of build a culture while also trying to do the work. So it's been, it's definitely been an interesting experience for us to come into a situation where there just really isn't, isn't that established culture. There isn't really good sort of awareness and knowledge about the benefits of the kind of nonpartisan observation that we see in other parts of the world. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping to learn from in this, from others in this conversation is like, what can we, how can we build that culture? What do we need to do to sort of strengthen the public awareness of uh, nonpartisan observation, either by citizens or by international observers? How do we, how do we raise that awareness? Um, but maybe I can now turn to Armin and sort of ask this question too, in the European context, you know, why is election observation necessary and what are some of the challenges that you faced in your work? Yeah, <clears throat> good day everyone and uh, it's good to see so many familiar names and faces uh, online. Thank you Avery for the question. Um, we see in, in throughout the European Union that there has been a backsliding of democracy and we see that somehow the natural reaction of that in society and of civil society is a increased engagement in elections. So we'll see that over the past 10 years since we have been active, that uh, citizen election observation has become more of a mainstream idea behind it. So we have been in Brussels um, during the most of the last two weeks and had several events and we have talked with um, members from European institutions and we have seen that there is an appetite um, that citizens and uh, civil society servers are becoming more active also in the upcoming European Parliament election 2024. However, you know, having said that, there is a wide gap between what is the legal uh, 
uh, situation on the ground in the different member states and what is the practice in uh, accrediting observers. So we see that uh, actually in the countries, even, uh, there is a, a, a practice of domestic election observation, while west of Vienna, we don't see that. And there is even no legislation in place like in our own country in Austria. Um, and that's why we founded it, uh, Michael and myself in 2013, that um, to advocate for domestic election in the Austrian legislation. I keep it. Uh, thank you, Avery. Yeah, excellent, Armin. We will come back to this in a minute. But, you know, Armin's response already highlights that not only uh, do we have, uh, you know, different uh, legislation in one EU member state here in, in, in Austria, what concerns national and international election observation. At the same time, this picture differs greatly between and among the 27 different member states of the European Union which of course renders the overall picture rather complex as we have seen since we first started to advocate and, and practice election observation and assessment at the European level around the European elections for the European Parliament since 2019. But let me bring this back uh, across the Atlantic, so to speak. I mean, we understand, uh, David, the uh, situation of observing uh, or trying to observe elections across the uh, uh, United States of America must, of course, be a, a, a very, you know, complex, if not to say complicated exercise. Maybe you can give us some more uh, insights from that angle. Sure, happy to. And I know that um, Ursula and <laughs> I have both experience, have experience in um, leading election observation work in the United States. So I hope they'll be able to contribute to at some point on this question. Um, I should clarify for the Carter Center, we've uh, worked mostly in just, we've targeted several states so far uh, and on the observation side, in particular, Georgia, Michigan, and Arizona. And what we've done there is I think reflective of the nature of the challenge. And it's, it goes back, Michael, to the conversation you and I had in Brussels where the, the seed for this conversation started when we realized that we are facing similar challenges in terms of the, the variation across states. For you, it's member states. For us, it's you know, United States. Uh, and there is a wide variation. And, and that's reflected in the work that we did very, very different across the three states because of political conditions, because of what was allowed legally really was the, the, the biggest factor. And as Avery mentioned, this challenge that we have of a needing to change the culture and to educate uh, American citizens and election officials about what is the role of citizen observation. We do have a very well established tradition of partisan observation and political parties playing a big role, the two major parties in particular across the states, but in some states, other parties. And even though there's variation in, in the exact roles they play, there's a very well established, recognized, comfortable sense that the parties are key actors in, in elections in the United States. And so coming to the, to the United States framework and context and saying, oh, we'd like to pursue citizen observation, in most places, they don't really understand and they, they get it mixed up with something it isn't. And so it takes a good, you know, a good deal of effort to really educate election officials and others uh, what, why we would do this and what it is. All right, thank you very much, David. Um, Avery, do you want to take it up from there? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I mean, sort of building on, on that, I wonder if, I mean, from your experience, if there are, um, you know, how have you handled this, this sort of the complexity of the different rules and regulations and have you faced similar challenges of sort of having to do this educational work at the same time as, as doing the observation work itself. It sounded like perhaps that, as you were saying, there's a little bit of a of movement that is building, that there is interest, but presumably there's still, there's still a lot of work to be done to sort of explain why this is necessary in the European context, particularly for the European parliamentary elections. Yeah, thank you, Avery. Yes, it's, it's, it's absolutely something which we also experience within the EU member states and especially 
uh, in the in the so-called old uh, EU member states that has advocacy about the role of including civil society in the electoral process as a safeguard and also to build resilience um, in electoral processes. So that's uh, something we experience in Austria, um, where we, where our organization Wahlbeobachtung.org emanates from, but also at the European level, um, where we operate as Election Watch EU. And um, but we, we see that there is a a, a shift of, of appreciation of what we are doing, uh, but nevertheless, legal changes are not that quick, and we still uh, need to for further changes in this respect. Uh, to give you an example, in 2019, we had an election assessment mission for 28 EU member states back then, and we asked for accreditation as citizen election observers in all member states, and we were in, as observers in 12 out of 28. Now, that's insufficient, yeah, if, if you want to... Uh, observe the election day also in the counting and we are not talking here only about control and oversight but we also talk about here of uh, extracting best practices and see what works in one member state very well maybe in terms of inclusion of persons with disability for example and then uh, bring that to the attention of other member states yeah so it's also that role of uh, citizen election observation observers, which we need to um, underline. And here we see um, there is still a scope for improvement as, um, you know, there's a publication we did in 2017 on the legislation and accreditation processes of uh, domestic election observers across the European Union. Uh, this publication was updated and, and uh, after the uh, European Platform to, for Democracy and Elections, they published a, uh, a similar publication this year and analyzing what is on the ground. And there's only nine EU member states which have legislation election observers and only eight have an accreditation system in place. Yeah, Maybe one of them, Finland, is uh, from the so-called old members. So all others like Austria, Germany, um, Spain, France, Portugal, they don't have uh, any accreditation place or legislation in place for domestic election observation. And still, you know, you know from our colleagues in Spain, you know, they are facing challenges there and there's a scope uh, for improvement. Now, if you look at the, at the uh, development since the 2019 elections, we see that also uh, the attention shifted and the awareness shifted. Yeah, and our uh, from the Political Accountability Foundation. They are preparing now a full-fledged election observation mission for the upcoming Polish elections. Uh, we have a similar in Romania. And as we prepare for the next year's European Parliament election, we see oh, there's an increasing awareness. However, we need to be careful here because there's also this so-called fake election observation. So it is the interest of the member states and its uh, election management bodies that to accredit who are uh, meeting and 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 adhering to the Declaration of Principles, yeah, and this is uh, probably the safeguard about fake observation, the real observation, and we need to sensitize the governments in this respect and to say, okay, there's a, a important to play for domestic election observation, but we also need to be careful um, about disinformation campaigns in this respect. So I uh, don't know how much. But probably I, I will have another intervention if possible. Thank you. You will have more chance to say something later, Armin. But that brings us back to Avery's earlier point, how much uh, explanatory work uh, uh, and uh, definitions are necessary to actually get the message across of what citizens election observers are. For those of us who have been socialized in international election observation, it may be more self-explicatory to explain what we mean by this role but for our national uh, counterparts and interlocutors it is often not clear that we actually mean non-partisan independent election observation and why we want to get engaged as such in in our home 
uh, uh, polities, so to speak. But let me bring this question to somebody who knows both worlds and who knows both worlds also uh, across the Atlantic, uh, Ursula. Uh, with with all the your rich electoral background, also having been an, uh, a member of the European Parliament in the past, you have you have led election observation, international election observation, in the United States. You have done that in Europe, and you have engaged with national election observers on both ends. So. Would you see differences between these policies? Where do you see uh, 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 similarities? And, and what were your experiences uh, along this journey up to now? Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, it's a pleasure to be greeting you all from Tashkent, Uzbekistan, where we are preparing for a presidential election this coming Sunday. We have a full-fledged election observation mission here with over 230 internationals uh, just joining us. So um, if I may just comment on why we are actually observing in the West, because I think this is something that, we're, that, that has been touched upon by Admin when he said he talked about backsliding in some, uh, let's say, established democracies. Uh, we've also talked about the challenges of the legal framework, be it at the state level in the United States, where international observers, and I speak from the perspective of international observers, are not permitted to observe either all or parts of the election process. Um, uh, or in, as uh, Armin also pointed out, many countries um, in Western Europe where there is no legal provision for observers. So why are we even observing elections in the West? I would say, firstly, because apart from the backsliding, no election is perfect. Um, and there are challenges everywhere. And there are challenges that are more prevalent uh, or more visible um, in uh, let's say established democracies, because there we do not expect strange and underhand dealings uh, on E-Day itself. We don't expect ballot stuffing. We don't expect uh, manipulation of uh, results protocols. So the the way that influence that that elections are influenced unfairly um, is an area where maybe domestic observers are going to be challenged to see. Uh, and because this, for example, will be things that crop up with the misuse of administrative resources. This is, you know, uh, incumbents um, basically giving away um, social benefits just ahead of elections, misusing their office, misusing their position to have greater media coverage. When we come to media, we might have concentration, excessive concentration in the media, or even media which is very closely aligned with a, a ruling option. And this is something we're seeing in Central Europe. So somewhere between, you know, I would now firmly put, you know, Poland and Hungary in the West camp, uh, but we have seen these practices here. And then we have um, deficiencies in the legal framework. We've already addressed the deficiencies in terms of right to observe, mainly for domestic uh, um, observers, uh, but also with things like uh, regulating campaign finance, or even things in the wider context like uh, defamation. Criminalization of defamation, for example, still exists in the French uh, uh, criminal code. So because the, the matters that actually draw our attention as international long-term observers, like an ODEA OSCE mission, are not E-Day related. It's something I maybe we can discuss, uh, how much of these trends can the domestic observers who are tend to be focused on E-Day procedures and have fewer resources to follow some of this, these uh, topics, how much they can actually do and also whether they actually require accreditation to be able to follow media landscape uh, or to assess the, the, legal, the legal framework. So maybe accreditation is, it would be 
great if they had it, but it's not necessary to do some of the aspects that they need to focus on. Um, why we observe in the West, in the case of the OSCE participating states, they have made a commitment to this. They have actually made a commitment to invite international observers from ODA OSCE. In fact, to my knowledge, only one of the participating states has openly refused to invite us, and that was Belarus. So by no way could we put them in the, in the Western camp. No Western, no Western established democracy uh, has, has refused uh, an election observation mission. And thirdly, and my final point in this first round is, because it makes our work in countries like Uzbekistan easier. I came here directly from France. I was doing a follow-up mission, following up from the French parliamentary and presidential elections of 2022. It's very difficult for us as international observers to impress on newer, more fragile democracies that certain standards are universal if they do not see that we also insist on those standards in, in the established democracy. So I would say, because there are deficiencies everywhere, because there are sometimes commitments, and because it also sets an example which is um, important for the promotion of democracy and, and, and democratic elections, wherever in the world we may observe. So hopefully um, it answers the initial round, but it also poses this question about how the domestic observers are organized and what they actually observe. And are they only focused on E-Day procedures? My experience is in the countries I have observed, you will not see flagrant systemic violations on E-Day. A final anecdote, 2020, a memorable election for everybody who participated and probably the one I will always remember. Um, when it came to the count, we had, we had phone calls from civil society saying, please, please send your observers to the count in this or other state because the atmosphere was getting tense, even there were even threats unacceptable made against election administration. I mean, it was a very, very fraught situation. They said, please send us observers. We need your eyes. You are the credibility. You'll be able to report that things are going well or not so well. We could have complied had it been within the law and we have to abide by the law and we were not able to comply because we were prohibited from observing. So opening remarks from me and maybe some discussion points as well. Thank you very much. Well, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Ursula. And uh, I, I believe maybe Avery and David may, may comment, you know, from, you know, this urge to respond and, and the difficulty uh, not being able to, because it's not in the law, you know, in the United States. But thank you really for bringing uh, international standards and regional commitments. Uh, into this uh, discussion of ours, because that is really uh, the basis of what we do as international election observers. And we also aim to ground our work in this human rights approach as citizen election observers. But uh, let us uh, bring it back to the, the Americas, really. And Brenda, you, you have been looking into elections, you know, uh, a, across uh, the continents, north and south. Uh, as well as being based in the United States and looking at the US in comparison to, to other uh, uh, countries in the, uh, in the OAS as well. And while you have met the colleagues and peers from the Carter Center in other countries before, now you encounter them also you know, uh, uh, domestically in, in the United States. So what is your perspective on, on your own? but also ongoing uh, uh, and exchanges on election observation in the USA uh, from that perspective. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. Um, so I just wanted to uh, share with you some thoughts about that to follow up what Ursula was saying. I think um, political participation, it's not only voting, and that's something that it's, uh, a newer idea. When we started in 1962 at the OAS to observe elections, 
you know, things were quite different. And the idea of what an electoral observation mission could do was quite different. It was more about if things were done right, if there was ballot stuffing and all those kind of things, but political participation has expanded and so have electoral observation missions. So in that sense, we at the OAS understand political participation from the perspective of citizen observers, like an expansion on those rights. You know, it's not only your right to vote or to be elected. This is a different way of participating in your domestic politics. And I think um, that it's quite important and quite relevant in democracies like the US and other democracies in, uh, in our region where, you know, we think that things have gone that they are good in the charts and numbers in all these international scales uh, of, of democracy are good, but they still need uh, some support from, um, from electoral observations. We, we started observing in the US in 2016, and obviously the Carter Center was one of our points of reference um, here in the US because uh, it was quite a challenge to start in a country like this. I think it's the most federal country that we've observed, even though we have countries like Brazil and Mexico that are, that are federal countries, but are not as decentralized. So obviously um, having the Carter Center as part of the DOP community uh, was great for us because it opened um, a lot of eyes and a lot of doors here. Um, I think it was, it is quite relevant that now the US, uh, obviously OAC have, has been participating as observers for a longer time for the OAS. It has been since 2016. So we did two uh, electoral observation missions here. And we obviously value a lot the work that citizens, observers, nonpartisan especially do here. Um, it's here in the US, it's not only focused on election day, they have a variety of organizations that observe different aspects of the process. And, and I, think, um, I think there's a lot of work to be done yet, uh, but it's quite relevant what they're doing uh, nowadays. I think there's also new challenges for our democracies and so yes, people vote and they have no issues, but now we have all this situation with misinformation, disinformation, and what's gonna go on with that. And it's a very vast um, aspect of the, of the processes, not only in the US, in every country. Um, so having probably observers that can focus on that particular issue can support electoral management bodies to know how to move forward. Uh, and, and provide new ideas on how to, um, you know, work with this new challenge in the years to come. So I think definitely there's value uh, having national health service in any kind of democracy because of old challenges and new challenges that are going to come. Um, so I think uh, it's it's really good that the that the Carter Center has started to bring their international experience to the national field and 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 support different states where allowed uh, to to have their observations and to have their their knowledge um, and the things that they can bring to the table. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Brenda. I'm great uh, that you can participate in this conversation despite the early morning hours, you know, on a personal level, I had the opportunity to work uh, together with and alongside our colleagues from the OAS in Guyana a few years back, where it was great in the field to have the Carter Center, the European Union, uh, the Commonwealth, CARICOM, and the OAS are all sitting around the table, you know, and, and, and discussing issues as they, as they arise. And it's, it's fantastic to, to, you know, move these conversations also into, into venues like this year. And secondly, you have, you have brought up uh, the, the question of, of new challenges, um, uh, old challenges and new challenges. And in the second part of the discussion uh, today, we, we also want to name them more concretely and see what prospectives 
uh, what perspectives that gives us for, for, for our ways ahead uh, for election observation in the US and in, in, in Europe. But before we do that, uh, uh, last but not least, let us bring in the, uh, the remaining participant on the roundtable in this uh, conversation, uh, Olufuntu. Uh, you have rich, long-standing experiences with uh, uh, election observation across the African continent. You have uh, uh, you are providing capacity building for uh, uh, African election observers in various contexts. Against this background, what do you hear in this conversation? Uh, uh, what, what can you contribute from your perspective, but also what do you think are the, the lessons learned that uh, European and American election observers could learn from the existing experience of uh, African uh, election observers. Um, thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me to the panel. And it's it's quite interesting, you know, to listen to the different developments um, across Europe and across the Americas. Um, I mean, I think first is just a set of you know observations, or should I just say some thoughts in terms of how. Um, the role of citizen observers and international observers um, within these two contexts, or should I say Western contexts, um, is quickly evolving you know, to address the emerging um, challenges. Um, I was discussing with a couple of colleagues across the continent today, and you know, the first thing um, everyone said is the level of public trust um, in the context you know, determines how far and how much we want to put into questions of monitoring, observing, um, and that really, you know, is the the very basic contextual difference as you go um, across. And over time, um, I, I think until the 2016 elections in the US, I, I didn't even hear much about election observation in the US. But you know, as issues around the role of technology, disinformation, um, changing narratives around you know, the credibility of an electoral process emerged. You heard a lot more about the role of the OAS, the role of OSCE in observing the election, citizen observers as mobilized by the Carter Center. So for me, it's, it's quite interesting um, to see you know, how initiatives are quickly you know, um, adapting to the emerging um, issues and it's also interesting to see how legal frameworks are they you know recognizing the role of different levels of ob observers um and you know the levels of access um that they can have it's interesting um that you know across a number of african states some laws don't even you know refer to the role of observers it's left to the discretion of election management bodies to determine um, the level of access and the different groups of people um, who can come. It's also on the international level, also interesting to see that it's only member state based institutions that seem to have that space to come into you know, the US or European states to, to do international um, observation apart from you know, the ING use like your Carter Center and uh, NDI and the rest of them. Uh, but here in Africa, you know, we have the EU observing elections, um, you know, without necessarily, you know, being uh, member states uh, funded. Uh, but um, the question on, um, you know, what what's could be lessons uh, learned, you know, comparative um, across the two contexts. I think the first for me, when we think about citizen observers is a question of resilience. Um, as citizen observers have you know, grown in their different efforts to you know, develop methodologies, be present across the context, you also have you know, governments and uh, different groups you know, building their own methodologies to counter these efforts. So the level of resilience we've seen around here, I think in Eastern European, well, in the European context, you could find, you know, comparative efforts. But in the US, um, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, but I'm yet to see, you know, a lot more efforts um, there. Um, the other 
point is about the level of adaptation we have across uh, the African continent. Uh, you said how to do it this way on election day, the technology goes off or the internet is off and we all have to adapt and think, how can we still bring our assessments to bear within um, such uh, groups? We also have emerging trends here of cross-border uh, solidarity across the different citizen observer groups. Because if you leave it at national level, like I'm saying, there are lots of countervailing efforts you know, to stop what citizen observers are doing. So you have a lot of coalition building at national level across sub-regions just to have citizen observers um, you know, support each other. Lastly, I'd just like to talk about the level of effort taken you know, to build scientific methodology. When I think about the US, I think it started more with community efforts, community monitoring, but as you could see the need arise, citizen observation is now becoming you know, a stronger thing. And um, just you know, to then see you know, uh, observation in the US as well, move to that level of rigor and scientific and systemic um, efforts will be quite um, interesting. Um, let me stop there. Thank you. All right. That was already very rich and comprehensive, Olofunto. But allow me just a quick clear, uh, follow up question right away, because you have rightly said uh, normally it is uh, the, the, the European Union who is sending observers to Africa and it may be colleagues from NDI or the CARPA Center and others who are, who are coming to observe in, in African nations. So knowing that you, of course, do not represent the African Union. But what about reversing the perspective? Uh, can you imagine that African Union observers would be sent to observe European national elections or, or elections to the European Parliament as such? <laughs> Um, it, it's an interesting uh, question. I, I can even help you add one more. People say, why is the EU not observing in its own member states? Um, although I think the answer there is quite uh, straightforward, is about harmonizing efforts between the OSCE and the EU and using European uh, taxpayers' money more effectively. Uh, vessels. We're here in Africa where we have like multiple layers and it's all the same taxpayers' money. However, to answer that particular question, whether we will see AU observers or just an African group uh, come to European parliamentary elections or go to the US to observe an election. Um, I think it's a two-sided answer for me. First is, do we have the resources to do so? Or is it going to be a, a situation where we want to say to the EU, can you fund me to come and observe your elections? Um, that is the first question. The other then is level of access. I am not aware that there are restrictions on access if you do request to be present at these elections. The question is, are you willing and can you fund yourself? However, I would then make a comment from experience. Um, we were in my previous uh, job, we've, we've facilitated um, a group of observers to observe the last European Union um, elections. And the experience was quite different as we went across different countries because we, we, we developed it in a way that they could go across four, uh, no, I think it was five uh, countries within the Schengen you know, states. So with one visa, you can get around. And there were countries that just simply said, sorry, we don't have time to talk to you. But you see, in Africa, that would never happen. The European Union Observer Mission or Carter Center wouldn't write to your office as the election management body. And you will say, oh, you know, it's the election. It's three days to the election and we can't speak to you. That will appear quite openly in a report, you know. Um, but we found this, you know, in that particular experience. But, you know, speaking about the overall um, space, the EU, you know, didn't say, don't come. And these observers were allowed to come. Um, but like I'm saying, they were welcomed differently as we went across different countries. And there were countries that just said, sorry, we can't host you. We can't have a briefing with you at this time. We're too busy. That would never happen in Africa. It's more like because it's the EU or because it's just an international observer mission, they must come in and they must have access um, to all aspects of the uh, process. For instance, the AU guidelines actually say so that member states should give access to all aspects. 
I don't think you will get that level of um, access if you were to go, you know, to the EU or to the US um, for such a process. Yeah. Well, we also don't get it in every African country, and I think that's part of the exercise to actually uh, uh, observe the space that's observable and, and, and negotiate the space that is there for international and citizen election observers, in particular in contexts where such spaces are closing. But Olofunto, yeah, spot on, you know, thank you very much for, for uh, nailing, uh, uh, nailing the point here, but also raising very important open questions, and I think uh, uh, we should we should think further on along these lines and see you know what can be possible uh, around this also with a view to the next round of European elections that we are uh, facing next year. But wow! So this was already a, a very very rich uh, first round with many different perspectives, and we could probably take up many of them. And some of you may may wish to have additional comments. From my side, I think one. One point that would be good to, to hear from some speakers is in, in a short pointed contribution, what are, what are the key challenges you know, uh, of election observation today uh, with a view to the next European elections, with a view to the next US presidential elections, with a view to technological changes and so forth. But uh, every I, I've been uh, asking questions here now for a long time, and many things were said. Maybe you want to 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 rephrase and reframe a little bit the discussion we had so far, and and also you know send off this short round of of, of second questions from your. No, thank you so much, much, Michael. I think that that is a great question. I'd love to hear from all of the panelists on sort of you know looking forward next round of elections, what do you see as some of the main challenges that we should be aware of? And maybe I would just add, if you have thoughts on sort of how we could bring the research community, the scholarly community into some of these conversations to help us either sort of think forward on those challenges or think more about our, our methods, approaches, other research questions, we'd love to, to hear that too. So maybe I could start with Armin and then David, and then we'll go to Ursula Alafunto and Brenda. Uh, thanks, Avery. Yeah, very, very interesting question. And I, I mentioned the Declaration of Principles, uh, which um, was first in two thousand um, inaugurated in in at the UN by international observer organizations like Carter Center and NDI and and the European Union and DE. Um, then in two thousand twelve, that followed for the national. Uh, and, and citizen-led election observation missions organizations. And uh, Wahlbeobachtung.org, which is our um, name in Austria, was the, first <clears throat> was the first organization in Western Europe which applied to become a member of this uh, G, uh, GNDEM, which, it, which is now the, the umbrella organization of all the domestic election observer organizations worldwide. So now there are altogether some 251 um, organizations in 89 countries. But uh, looking at it from, from maybe an academic perspective, it would be interesting to understand uh, to which degree these organizations are monitored or are they are adhering to the Declaration of Principles and the Code of Conduct. I think that's really should be the future to build up a strong secretariat and a strong monitoring body to understand whether um, these organizations are uh, living up to the principles and also then safeguard the whole process of election observation and its its credentials against um, disinformation. Yeah, the, the more we go into um, the question of upholding and strengthening the electoral processes in our, you know, uh, advanced or, or uh, established uh, democracies, the more there will be also the attempt to spread disinformation and undermine the trust among voters, like we had the example in uh, the latest US elections. But we also have still the, the big challenges in um, the European Union member states, where, for example, in Hungary, uh, citizen-led election observation is not 
and is not foreseen in the law. So they are not accredited. And we have the challenges that uh, um, Olofunto mentioned as well, um, that there is a lack of access and we have a, um, this, this uh, deteriorating practice uh, in a member state of the European Union. So what does it then um, mean for the conduct of the European Parliament elections next year in 24? I would stop here and also um, uh, give opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, that's a very interesting story of thinking about mis and disinformation, not just in the context of attacks on the electoral process, but also sort of ways that it is used to undermine the credibility of nonpartisan election observation. And maybe there are some research questions to sort of sort of bolster that that issue of the integrity of the organizations themselves. David, I don't know what what are your thoughts? Thanks, Avery. Uh, thanks, everyone. A couple of things to tie um, a few of the questions together and responses. First, I just think it's it's important to again underscore points that several have already made about this universally applicable uh, angle of political participation as a right, and that this is something that we all share across countries, across societies, and it needs to be brought to bear to every society, every election. We all have all elections have uh, ways to, that they can be improved. And the commitment of this community, the election observation community, is to try to help bring that about from an objective basis of what are recognized democratic standards and international principles. Um, in terms of some of the specific challenges and, and the research questions that could be where the academic and research community could help us, I think you know, going back to the question of uh, in, in both the EU area and in the United States, this need for change really of both culture and election law and access, you know, what are, maybe the research community can help us understand what are the best ways to try to bring that about? Because it is really a dual challenge of a lack of familiarity culturally as well as in law and what are ways that other countries have been able to in other you know, comparative contexts where those kinds of changes have been able to be brought about would be helpful. Because I think those really are in some ways, the, the central problems. One last point to just mention uh, as, a, as a particular challenge in, in the United States context, Avery, and may, maybe you can speak a little bit about this before you uh, ask some of the others too about anything that I may have missed. But one thing that I'd, I'd like to bring out is the challenge that we're facing in the US too is, you know, while citizen observation is, you know, is grounded and so is international observation on the sense that we have a commitment only to the democratic process. There's not a political interest in any particular outcome. And the Carter Center is trying to bring that work to our context. We're trying to find local partners and others who, who can do this work. There is a threat of groups that are, um, you know, kind of, it's, it's, a, it's akin to the zombie monitoring group, but it's a little bit different. But uh, there's the similarity is politically motivated groups that are wrapping themselves in a cloak of election integrity and acting as if they have they don't have a political interest, but they really do have a political interest. And that, I think, is you know part of this. You know, it, it can confuse the context of what are what are people really trying to achieve. But Avery, maybe. Um, before you go to others, I hope you'll, or, or after, that you'll leave yourself a chance to respond to some of these questions, again, as you are really have the most experience of any of us at the Carter Center on, in this area. Thanks, oh. David. No, I mean, I think that that is a, a really significant challenge that we're facing. You know, part, part of the issue, issue in the United States is that, as I think you were alluding to earlier, David, and others have mentioned, political parties and sort of the politics are baked into the process anyway. And so the whole concept of nonpartisanship in the context of U.S. elections is kind of confusing and confounding in some ways to people here because, you know, our chief election officers in most states are elected by on a partisan political party ticket. In many states, elections are administered by people who are elected on tickets or in bipartisan pairs. There isn't there isn't necessarily this idea of nonpartisanship. So that already makes it quite challenging to sort of introduce this idea of nonpartisan election observation. People ask like, well, there's no such thing as nonpartisanship. How is that? What? What? It's just mind blowing. Um, 
but then we also, as you're saying, David, there is this sort of this movement of people with definite political partisan interests who are wearing this this cloak of nonpartisanship and sort of muddying the waters. And so we find ourselves often in conversations with election officials talking not only about, you know, how can you make the process more transparent, give more access to election observers, but also talk about the responsibilities of observers and what expectations should be of credible observers. So kind of going back a little bit to sort of Ar Armin's points about the integrity of observation, trying to help election officials to have tools in place to make sure that they are being observed by credible groups who are willing to sign a code of conduct, willing to talk about how they do their work, willing to be transparent about what their goals are in the work. And so we find ourselves walking in this very interesting sort of gray zone of both seeking to sort of expand access while also recognizing that we need to be responsible and constrained and we need to be asking for some sort of framework, constraining frameworks in some ways around codes of conduct and things like that, that can help make, make observations something that is useful and isn't um, used as, as a weapon against the electoral and democratic process. Ursula, over to you. What what do you see as some of the challenges? Research questions, please. Uh, thank you. Well, I was making notes uh, on, of all your interventions, and I would like to really, really focus on, on, on three challenges. The first was very aptly um, sparked by um, Brenda's intervention and also echoed by David saying that actually the right to observe is an electoral right, a citizen's electoral right, as is the right to vote and the right to stand for in an election. And actually, um, the participation of citizens in this election observation addresses a challenge we haven't talked about, but is something that we all face, and that is voter apathy, and especially uh, disengagement of, in the process, especially of young voters. Uh, they tend to be, in many countries, the least active when it comes to moving themselves and getting out on election day. And actually, having this uh, third aspect, this third right, and encouraging especially young citizens to participate in the observation is a fantastic mobilization to get them involved in, in, in the political discourse, not necessarily, but to be involved in the politics of the country in the best possible way. So by having this right and telling people they have this right to observe, we actually address a challenge we didn't mention, but this is voter apathy, lack of interest, especially among young voters. The second very important uh, challenge, which was uh, raised uh, by Ulufunto, was public trust. And uh, this especially looking forward to the 2024 in, in Europe, of course, in the EU, I've been following very closely. Uh, my heart is always close to the United States, having been consul there for some time and having observed the election. And I follow very closely the, the political situation in the US, but looking forward to the 2024 election. Um, and this lack of trust, when we, when we concluded the election in uh, observation in 20, something like over 70% of Republican voters genuinely believed that election had been, had been stolen, had been manipulated, uh, that it was fraudulent. And, it was not. I mean, this was not for OSCOD to say. Numerous U.S. courts uh, put, put play to any of these suggestions. So to, to enforce public trust, the citizens need to be involved. I gave you the anecdote, actually, like, please, please come. You then give um, the citizens um, trust in the system if you are there and you are impartial and respected observers. So this challenge going forward into European elections next year, it's going to be a bumper year, and the US 2024, of course, public trust. And the third topic, these zombie, I love, David, I love this uh, um, term, zombie monitors. Uh, we, they pop up quite often where I am here today, Central Asia, Kazakhstan, uh, um, uh, Uzbekistan. We call them rent a quote. These are not entirely, they're either very naive or just completely cynical, or quite honestly, I mean, corrupt. Former politicians quite often, 
out on their own, who are invited by the authorities, you know, five-star hotel, business class, uh, all expensive paid trips. So their one job is to, at a certain point, when a television camera uh, is pointed in their direction and somebody says, well, how is this election going? And they say, well, it all looks good to me. Okay, but um, genuine observers, and of course, you know, these are small annoyances. We have these people popping up here, but Avery, you referred to this and how it is a challenge. And I think the, the key word is to instill in the, in the wider understanding that you trust observers who adhere to a very strict and rigid code of conduct. Without this and without knowledge of their conduct, conduct, their transparency in their work, people are going to trust nobody if they, if they start having these zombie observers. And to address your final question, Avery, you said, how do we get the scholarly community involved in the process? Well, actually, it's easier in the West. They have a job to do. If we look at uh, um, things you can examine before E-Day, like media monitoring, like examination of the legal framework, but also post-election, um, complaints, appeals, how the courts work, this is something that can be done so well by the scholarly community. And this, I think, would supplement um, the fresh-faced, eager, young STOs who go out and actually observe the counting and the voting and the tabulation. There is definitely a place for these experts um, to be not necessarily there at the ballot box, but to be there following the process from the day that election is announced right through to when the final result is announced and beyond when all when all complaints have been dealt with. So that would be my intervention for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Wonderful. And Alessandro, same question to you. Um, thanks, Avery, and thanks for all the people who spoke before me. I, I agree with most of what has been said. Um, let me start off with the question of effective communication and explaining who you really are and what's the scope of your mandate? What do you really do? How are you different from you know the next person who just says, because I support X, Y, Z candidate, and this polling station is right next to my house. I'm gonna stay here. Um, and you know, also just explain the full details of methodology ahead of deployment. This this hasn't been like a, a, a common practice, but I mean, one of the recent elections we've just come through and the Carter Center was there, you know, we have citizen observers saying, this is what we've seen. And then you have other CSOs coming up to say, oh, but we had polls before the election saying this, this is what an opinion poll is, but that's not what citizen observation is. So um, just basic, first of all, effective communication about methodology, about the scope of work. That for me has been a challenge, you know, just getting everybody to understand. One other uh, point I would say is, um, we've talked about the question of disinformation, uh, one other challenging area for citizen observers is online campaigning and the impact of emerging uh, um, new spaces for uh, political campaign finance, uh, which is becoming more and more blurry. You know, you think about the online campaign space, questions of use of the social media space and all that, uh, it becomes quite difficult and challenging and you need to just continue sharpening the methodology to address some of these issues. The question of fake observers, I don't think that can be overemphasized. And I think that needs more work with electoral management bodies themselves, just for them to understand. Why do we think this particular group is more um, credible than the next group. And of course, we have situations as well, probably Eastern European countries can relate, where you have electoral management bodies setting up their own citizen observer groups who can say what they want. Um, the question of research community, I would like to talk about the emerging uh, recommendations from observer missions. Um, can they do more work in, first of all, analyzing these recommendations and then contextualizing the recommendations? Because sometimes uh, from a practitioner's perspective, there's a way we look at things and there's a way the academic community can help to shed 
more light on, okay, if you say, re, you know, review the law for X, Y, and Z, an academic can look more into that look at better legal analysis, comparative perspectives, and advise the public and the electoral management bodies on what does this really mean within our context. So for me, I think that is a very uh, good area for the academic community to come in. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Olofunto. Another uh, great round, very rich round of, of profound comments that will give us a lot to to, to think about on, on the way forward. Before we open up the discussion now to, to uh, the audience as well, some people already have their, their hands up. Uh, just a few interim you know, summary points just to, to uh, not to lose track of the discussion that we had. I think we started out by uh, mapping what actually has been done yet in terms of international and citizen election observation uh, in the United States and across the European Union. I think we can yet do that more clearly, more profoundly on the basis of our own efforts and on the basis of existing documentation in the public domain, OAS, ODIA reports and so forth, just to really know what we are talking about. And then the way forward seems clear, you know, the next elections are literally around the corner, US presidential elections, uh, European Parliament elections both next year. And I think several people were talking to each other when uh, they were uh, giving uh, advice on, 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 on key challenges uh, to, to be tackled. And interesting how prominently the topic of zombie observers has arisen in the, the debate today. We yesterday, just yesterday, had a conversation on this inside uh, 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 a small group uh, with European parliamentarians. And one of the things that came out, and I think David was pertaining to it as well, is the gray zones around this. On the one hand, we have, we have people, uh, as Ursula noted, you know, driving around with, with, with something next to criminal intent yeah, uh, to, to provide uh, uh, false testimony. But there are so many gray zones of what is and what is not uh, uh, an observer with integrity. And, and that was really a key question today. How can we safeguard the observer's integrity? How can we assure that observers are, tr are trusted if we want them to, to enrich the electoral process with trust? And I think it's around definitory and communication questions like this, that we could continue to, to have this conversation beyond today and also uh, in the future.